It's 11.30. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And can I begin this uh, 2019 spring press conference by welcoming all of you to the All England Club on this lovely sunny morning. And thank you very much indeed for coming here today. I'm Philip Brooke, Chairman of the All England Club since 2010, and alongside me is Richard Lewis, our Chief Executive. I mentioned 2010, as at our AGM in December, I shall be stepping down uh, as Chairman after nine years in the role, and will be succeeded by Ian Hewitt. Ian is well known to many of you as a long-standing member of our committee, Chair of the Wimbledon Foundation, and is an excellent choice to be taking on this demanding role. And I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate him on his appointment and to wish him every success in the years ahead. So with that, and before we get started, some housekeeping items to mention. First of all, at the end of our presentation, and in the interests of being sustainable, we will be emailing you the press packs that we usually hand out, but hard copies will be available upon request. Following the Q&A, there will be an opportunity for any of you who, we, who are interested to go and have a look at number one court, so please congregate at this desk if you would like to do so. And lastly, lunch is in the competitors' lounge upstairs. So turning to today's agenda, once again it is an agenda for investment, investment in our estate, in the 2019 championships and in prize money. And we know from experience that with investment comes growth. And I have been privileged to witness the phenomenal growth of the championships over the past decade as a result of investment year in, year out all aimed at improving the experience of everyone coming to Wimbledon, be they players, the media, the public, or following Wimbledon on television or social media. So turning firstly to our estate, we are coming to the end of another busy nine months with around 40 projects, large and small, being completed in time for this year's championships. Most significant of which is our flag flagship unveiling 2019 the number one court and I would like to start with a short video which shows the final stages of construction since last year. Look out for Europe's largest mobile crane and the truss lifts, all 11 of them, each weighing 100 tonnes. Okay, so hopefully that has whetted the appetite for those of you who will see the stadium later on. And we are delighted that the project is now complete, on time and on budget. It is the culmination of around five years of hard work, two years of design and planning, and three years of construction. And my thanks to, to the team at Sir Robert McAlpine and also to our estate development team for their fantastic work on what has been a challenging and very complex piece of engineering to deliver. To remind everybody of what the project does deliver, a new fixed and retractable roof, increased capacity of around 1,000, taking the total to 12,345, new wider padded seats throughout the stadium, similar to centre court, 15 new hospitality suites, a magnificent living wall <coughs> either side of the very big screen that was first used last year, the walled garden food and drink facilities for the public 
and finally new changing and dining facilities for our officials. Before we leave number one court, some of you will remember that we hosted an, an event to celebrate and test the centre court roof in 2009 and ten years on we are delighted to be doing the same for number one court. So on Sunday the 19th of May from 2 to 5 p.m. we will welcome a capacity crowd to join us for a unique afternoon of tennis and music. We are delighted to be welcoming players from various decades, among them will be John McEnroe, Martina Navratilova, Goran Ivanišević, and Leighton Hewitt, with several other top players to be announced in the immediate run-up to the event. Paloma Faith will be our headline music act accompanied by the BBC Concert Orchestra and the Grange Park Opera Chorus, with tenor Joseph Kalea featuring at the start of the programme. And importantly, this is a charity event, with all of the ticket proceeds being shared between the Wimbledon Foundation and the charities chosen by the players. For the Wimbledon Foundation, we expect it to raise around £750,000 from ticket sales, public auction and other fundraising activities, with all of these proceeds going towards a new three-year fund entitled A Roof for All, aimed at supporting charities working to tackle homelessness in our local areas of Merton, Wandsworth and across London. Your help to publicise the event and particularly the 50 lots in the public auction would be much appreciated. But number one court is not all that we've been doing. We've also been busy with several other significant master plan, pro master plan projects. So completed this year, we have refurb refurbished our main ladies and gentlemen's dressing rooms, which are used by the top players during the championships. We've added an additional story to the museum building to house our growing numbers of staff. And we've developed a new brasserie for our members. And looking to the future, after this year's championships, we will start the Somerset Road project, which includes a 350-car underground car park with around 40 electric charging points, six new indoor tennis courts and six clay courts. It will become the new transport hub for the championships and the secure player drop-off. This project is expected to be completed in the winter of 2021. At Rains Park, at our community sports ground, we have planning permission to build three additional indoor courts and up to 16 grass courts. And the first phase of this project begins in June. And on the Millennium Building, which is approaching 20 years old, we are starting to examine how to modernise this building and improve the facilities for competitors and the media. Next, I would like to touch upon the acquisition of Wimbledon Park Golf Club, which, as you will know, was con concluded successfully just before Christmas. In preparation for the land being available to us from 2022, we have begun initial work on a new All England Club master plan, a vision for the whole 120-acre site, and that is the area shown in pink on the slide uh, on the screens. And while there is much work to do, you'll be aware of some of our core aspirations and principles to bring Wimbledon qualifying onto our grounds, to improve, to provide an enhanced experience for all of our spectators and to deliver community use of the land year round. And as I'm sure I don't need to remind you, everything we do will be done in a Wimbledon way, respecting the long history and heritage of the land. And finally, from me, before I hand over to Richard, I thought it important to touch on our centre court uh, debenture issue, a major source of funding for the development of our estate. We are currently in the middle of the issue, which, co which covers the 2021 to 2025 championships, and so far, demand remains as high as ever. All being well, when it closes on the 10th of May, the issue will be oversubscribed, despite a 60% increase in price and will raise around £160 million net of VAT and costs, 
all of which will be invested in the continued development of our estate. And now let me hand over to Richard to share with you some of the headlines for this year's championships. Thank you, Philip, and good morning, everyone. I'd like to start by referencing the fantastic period of sport we have ahead of us this summer. And in particular, we are proud that women will play its part in the amazing summer of women's sport. In fact, the Ladies' Trophy will feature at the BBC's launch event tomorrow. So now on to the championships themselves. And firstly, our events. Following last year's successful exhibition of quad wheelchair tennis, we are pleased to be introducing quad wheelchair singles and doubles events and look forward to welcoming the quad players to Wimbledon this year. In addition, as we announced last year, the ladies' qualifying singles will be 128 draw, joining the gentlemen's also at 128. And so, as expected, there will be no doubles qualifying. Lastly, with the advent of the new number one court and its extra seating, our ground capacity will increase from 39,000 to up to 42,000. Turning to tennis, we are pleased to have made several significant changes for 2019. Our start time has moved to 11 a.m. for the outside courts to ensure that we can complete our more matches in better light in the evening. And as announced in the autumn last year, we will have a tie break at 12 all in the final set of all events, including juniors. With the exception of the wheelchair events, we have always played a tie break at six all. We're introducing Hawkeye for electronic line calling and player challenges on courts 14 to 17 with more courts to be added next year. And recognising the importance for parity, we will aim to have one heat rule across all the draws with exact details still to be finalised. And nobody will be more surprised than me if we have to implement the heat rule. <laughs> with the advent of the number one court roof, we revised our roof protocol with a few significant changes. To be arranged matches, we'll complete under the roof and any matches which are stopped by the 11 p.m. curfew will return in daytime conditions the next day. On the subject of the shot clock, it will not be in place at Wimbledon this year, but it is highly likely that we will introduce it for 2020. As a reminder, this is not a rule change, just a visible device on the court to manage the rule. Lastly, we remain vehemently opposed to any form of coaching during a match. It is against the fundamental nature of our sport, and despite many contrary views, we have seen no evidence to suggest that it enhances the player or fan experience. Earlier this year, we were proud to announce our junior grass court strategy, and I would like to touch on it very briefly today. Many of you will recognise our good friend Paul Hutchins in the photograph who believe passionately in the power of the prospect of playing at Wimbledon to motivate young players to recognise the importance of grass court tennis and to seize the opportunity to compete on it from a young age. But many juniors still turn, turn up at Wimbledon having never played on grass. This thought is at the heart of the strategy through which in col collaboration with the LTA we aim to provide opportunities for juniors to practice and compete on grass at all levels of their development and nurture their desire to compete at Wimbledon to protect grass court tennis in the, for, the, for the future. In particular, we have announced three major aspects. The expansion of the 18 and under grass court season, a new event in Nottingham, to add to the existing event in Roehampton, which creates a three-week season for juniors, including the junior championships. The continued growth of the road to Wimbledon in the, in the UK and across Asia for 40 and unders which now enables over 7,000 juniors to compete on grass with a chance to compete at Wimbledon every August. Now, I'd like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to Paul Hutchins, who founded this event on behalf of the club and the LTA, and worked tirelessly to nurture it to the success that it is today. He is sorely missed by us all. And finally, the natural evolution of the road to Wimbledon, the introduction of a 14 under championships during the second week of the championships from 2022 onwards. We will invite the best, world's best 14 under players to compete at Wimbledon, the first Grand Slam, Grand Slam tournament to open up to this age group. Turning briefly to tennis in our lo local community, we are delighted that under the umbrella of the Wimbledon Foundation, our community sports ground, which opened in 2017, 
now has over 1,000 registered players. It's home to 160 ball boys and ball girls for their weekly training and is one of the training locations for the Wimbledon Junior Tennis Initiative, which continues to del deliver the first taste of tennis to local school children in our local boroughs. Lastly, we are pleased to be maximising the opportunity presented by No Play on Middle Sunday, which, as you know, is critical for us in watering and resting, resting the courts. Together with the LTA, we will be growing our Tennis in the Park activity, which has previously taken place on Middle Saturday, an all-day free tennis session on the Wimbledon Park courts, which is open to all, and which we hope will make the most of the enthusiasm for playing tennis generated during the course of our event. The Wimbledon Museum will also be open for those who would like a look at the trophies and visit our exhibition on the history of number, court, number one court, which is highly recommended. Now for the important subject of the environment and how we make sure we operate in a sustainable way to, to play our part in this global challenge. Building on the removal of plastic straws and plastic bags from our operation in 2018, we have hired expertise to support this critical aspect of operational delivery delivery and are, plan and are pleased to share further enhancements for 2019. We are delighted to publicly announce that Wimbledon will feature one of the first 100% recyclable, recycled bottles from our partner Evian. Recognising the public re reaction against them, we have removed plastic bags from the racket string in operation, which means there will be 4,500 fewer plastic bags at this year's championships. We will have staff around the grounds to champion and support the public in discarding waste appropriately and we will have a sustainability demonstration area in the southern part of the grounds to showcase that women and other, what women and other major sports events could be like in 2030 and beyond and share some of the areas we are working on to get there. Moving on to our commercial progress, despite the uncertainty in the market, we are in the fortunate position to have certainty in our income, thanks to some very successful long-term partnerships. And we are delighted to be able to announce two new partners in American Express and Oppo. American Express, our new payments partner, is a great American brand with a strong pedigree in tennis through their work at the US Open. And Oppo, our new smartphone partner, is our first Asian partner recognising the growing importance of the Asian market to the championships and the role that the Wimbledon brand can play in supporting their objectives in the UK and Europe. Oppo has the fifth largest share of smartphone sales around the world and is second in the market in China, fourth in India. Of particular note is the camera which with its manual shutter will help us to show off the beauty of the championships to the smartphone generation. As many of you know, attracting the next generation of fans is another challenge for all rights holders, and we recognise that we don't just compete against sport any longer, but also entertainment. Many of you may be familiar with the concept of secret cinema, and so we are proud to be bringing the concept of immersive theatre and cinema to sport through the launch of Wimbledon Rematch 1980. Set in a recreated all in club of the 1980s, this experience will allow ticket holders to relive all the drama and glory of the Championships 1980, including Borg and McEnroe's famous tiebreak. Taking place the weekend before Wimbledon and London, it will help provide a new launch pad for the Championships, and I look forward to seeing you all there. <laughs> Last but by no means least, before I hand back to Philip to unveil this year's prize money, we are pleased to share significant development with you for those wanting to come to Wimbledon. From this autumn, for the Championships 2020 onwards, access to the Wimbledon ballot will be online through our My Wimbledon platform on Wimbledon.com. I'm sure you can appreciate this has been a decision long in the planning. Our primary concern has always been to ensure that we deliver for our fans and maintain the accessibility of Wimbledon tickets for all ages and geographical locations. With the number one court celebration event as a successful test case for online ticketing, we are delighted to be making this change and look forward to ensuring that we provide a quality service for all of our fans all around the world. Thank you. I'll hand back to Philip. Thank you very much, Richard. So now the subject of prize money for the Championships 2019. So total prize money 
This year will be £38 million, pounds, a very healthy increase of 11.8% or £4 million on 2018. Gentlemen's and ladies singles champions will each receive £2.35 million. Pounds. That is a £100,000 increase on last year or 4.4%. And singles prize money for qualifying and for competitors in rounds one to three will incre increase by more than 10% as in 2018. In other words, as in 2018, there will be double digit increases for every singles player competing at the championships other than those who reach the last 16. Clear demonstration once again of our continued commitment to do what we can for players for whom it will have the most impact. And to reinforce this point, back in 2011, first round singles prize money at Wimbledon was £11,500. In 2019, it is £45,000, pretty much a fourfold increase over eight years. Staying with prize money, uh, for gentlemen's and ladies' doubles, there is a 14% increase and there is also a 6% increase in mixed doubles. And wheelchair prize money will increase by 47% this year, being a combination of double-digit increases for the existing wheelchair events and new prize money for the quad events that have been added this year. And finally, and in summary, as I hand over to Ian at the end of the year, I have been very fortunate to lead the club during a decade of strong investment uh, and growth, uh, during which time we have added a retractable roof to number one court, our, la our largest project ever financially. And this would be a good time to thank our debenture holders for their part in making this happen. We've enhanced the grass court season with the addition of an extra week and the creation of four new grass court tournaments. We've improved the facilities for everyone coming to the championships and those engaging with Wimbledon. We've increased our prize money dramatically so that over the past decade, prize money at Wimbledon has trebled. We've delivered around £375 million pounds, uh, of surplus to the LTA uh, for tennis in Britain, with the 2019 surplus expected to be another record high. Five years ago, we launched the Wimbledon Foundation to enhance our charitable giving, and last December we acquired Wimbledon Park Golf Club, tre trebling the size of our estate and uh, securing the future of our grounds. And finally, to say we've taken more control of our brand through the insourcing of our retail, our horticulture, our broadcast and our estate development activities. And looking to the future, the good news is we have a solid platform for further investment and growth thanks to the enduring appeal of Wimbledon and the loyal support of our stakeholders. And from this success, we can and will continue to reinvest whether that's through our prize money, the Wimbledon Foundation, the surplus, and of course, in the championships. But as always, there is still plenty, plenty of things to do to protect and strengthen our brand and to grow it further internationally, to protect and enhance grass court tennis and to grow it internationally, to maintain an influ influence in the world of tennis through our role in the game, uh, and very importantly, to develop a new All England Club master plan for the new expanded site, capable of keeping the championships at the pinnacle of tennis for many years to come. So with that, thank you all very much for your attention, and Richard and I are happy to take any questions you may have. For those of you who would like a hard copy of our press pack, Eloise has some available. If anybody would like to put their hand up if they'd like one, or... Something coming from that side as well.
What's that? And Reese had a hard copy. <laughs> okay. So let's take um, any questions that you may have, please. When you talk about the, the master plan, um, do you have a, a time limit on it or a projection? I mean, is it 5, 10, 15? Do you have different different ways of looking at that? It's too early to say, to be honest. So we are right at the beginning, again, of a master plan. We created one uh, seven years ago for the existing 40-acre site. And the development of that plan took us about a year before we got it to the point where we were comfortable publishing it. And so we're now starting again with a similar project, but this time looking not at the additional 80 acres, but the whole 120 acres and saying, how would we like Wimbledon to be in 20, 30 years from now? And that might mean some things that are current, currently on the existing site might move across into the park. Uh, I don't know. It's just too early to say, to be honest. But we are right now on the point of appointing an external firm of master planners to work with us. Please. What is the, the wheelchair's prize money? Again, 47%. Yes. Much bigger than others. Any yes. Any special reasons for this? So it's, it, it's a combination of, so this is the first year that we have uh, the quad wheelchair event as a championships event. And so for the first time, there is prize money for that event. So that's new money. And then separately, we have a double-digit increase in prize money for our existing wheelchair events. And you put the two together, and it, and it looks like uh, a, um, a, a much more substantial increase than for anything else. That's why. Thank you. Sure. You asked about um, cooperation between the four Grand Slam tournaments. This year, there's a different format at all four for how you uh, decide final sets, matches which go the distance. There are differences, for example, in who allows on-court coaching, who doesn't. Uh, there's differences in uh, stop clocks, etc. I wonder what efforts you have made or think need to be made for there to be more coordination between the Grand Slam tournaments so that you don't have confusion for the public and indeed for the players. Katie Bolter uh, this year in Australia was celebrating when she thought she'd won a match, but um, she hadn't won it because... Um, of the change to the, the tie-break system. I'm wondering what you feel about the the cooperation there should be. I mean, can I widen your question a little bit to say, I think, um, to tennis more generally beyond just the Grand Slams? And I think if you look around today, what you see is that in certain areas of our sport, there is very good cooperation. So the area of tennis integrity, the anti-corruption program, the anti-doping program, the sport comes together to decide what should be done and and, it's, and the cost of it is shared equally amongst amongst the sport. And we think that is a very good thing. And a recent example being the appointment of Jenny Price. That was a tennis decision. Jenny is now the chair of a new tennis integrity unit and is creating the board to work with her to take tennis integrity forward. And for me, that's a very interesting model of how tennis could cooperate um, uh, as a sport as a whole. And you've mentioned certain things to do with the rules of the game, but I, I, I would add to that list there is a need for, for further harmony, not just in that, but also in the area of the calendar, ranking uh, points, etc. So I, I do I agree with you there is more f for tennis to do. Chris? A question about your sustainability um, programme. Um, looks very good, but have you worked with any outside consultants in terms of the effectiveness so that you know that what you're doing is actually going to make a significant contribution to reducing emissions and resource use rather than just being the low-hanging fruit, which is easy to do to look good? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's easy to do. It's actually, so it's actually quite challenging operationally. Um, well, the answer is we've, we've hired a sustainability manager, as I mentioned in the presentation, brought in uh, expertise. We needed that expertise. And we, we will be working with outside agencies to be, uh, to be certain we're reflecting best practice. But we are on a journey. We talked about a journey last year. It's only just starting. And it, it's going to be a long journey. Um, it's, but it's something we're very committed to. And um, we will try our very best to ensure we are reflecting best practice benchmarked against the outside world. And measuring effectiveness? Yes, we will. We will absolutely be bringing in... Um, measures, we have some measures and we will be measuring ourselves quite stringently. Have there been any talks at all with Andy Murray about the possibility of a wild card this year? Either 
away, what would be the latest point that you would be able to award a wild card to him or anyone else who you uh, think would be welcome? So there's been no discussion with him as yet. I think it's too soon to know um, the answer to that one. And should he wish to apply for a wild card, he would do so in the normal in the normal way. And we have a, a regular scheduled meet, meeting ahead of the championships in order to decide um, which players receive wild cards. So what will be the last of the dates that he would have to... Ahead of that meeting. Ahead of that meeting. So what, what, what would be the date? Um, the exact date is... We'll get that to you in two seconds. Might be the 20th. Would you not be willing to give him a, a little bit longer because conceivably you could um, you wouldn't necessarily have to give him a wild card until possibly even up until the draw on the Friday before the tournament are you uh, saying that he would have to let you know before the first meeting we have a process which applies to all players competing in the championships and um, that is the process I expect us to follow we have held wild cards back before when there's been a, a I think I remember a couple of years ago for a player who was nursing an injury, wasn't certain they'd be fit. So if, if Andy came forward with a strong case, I'm sure we'd work with him. Yeah, that's probably the main thing to say. The back. Intrigued by your decision to introduce tiebreak at 12 all um, in the fifth, is that how did you end up? With that number, why not nine all or fifteen all? And are you recommending to include that into official scoring system and rules of tennis? Or do you want to take that? Or shall I have a go? I think we felt um, that twelve all was a good sort of middle point between. Well, we, as everybody knows, we've had an advantage final set forever at Wimbledon, and it can produce very exciting ends to matches. But it can mean that matches run, as we saw last year, can run very. Very, very late. For us, we felt that a tie break at 6-all in the final set was probably too early in that final set. and We wanted to give a bit more time for the players to to see if one, one or the other could win in, in, uh, in an advantage set uh, way. And 12-all means effectively they're playing one more set of tennis before you before you get to that point. So that was in our heads as to, um, as to the way of doing it. Simon? Um, I have a Justin and Gimmelstorp question. You uh, had a statement saying you wouldn't be invited to the Legends <coughs> doubles or the Royal Box, but um, are you still considering the credential issue? I'm, I'm thinking perhaps of the comparison with John Tomic, who was not um, given credentials to tournaments after he was involved in an assault case. Well, I'll take that one. So, uh, well, I think we've already made our position pretty clear with those first two decisions. So. Um, I think that, in a sense, speaks for itself. I think any application for a credential would have to be um, dealt with if, if or when that application came through, what it, what, what it was for, which third party it was to work with or for, and that sort of thing. But we've received no application at the moment. Can I follow up on that one? Uh, is there a legal issue of restraint of trade? I mean, if, um, say, John Isner said, Justin Gimblestop is my coach, my advisor, uh, I want him there, and... You said, well, no, on the basis of the court case, um, we're not giving him accreditation. Could he say, well, I'm not in jail, I'm free, you're restricting my ability to earn my living? Well, that, that's, a, to say the least, a very hypothetical um, question, and it, it takes me back to the point I've just made. It depends. If we get an application for accreditation, we'd have to look at what that application was for. Right. Um, I don't know which one of you would like to answer. I think yeah, I'm right in saying that last year was the first year since 2007 there was no British player uh, in the singles in the second week. Um, I'm just wondering how concerned you are that uh, going forward, uh, obviously Andy's future is uncertain at best, um, how concerned you are at the potential lack of domestic interest uh, in the championships beyond uh, the first week we'll probably have one, uh, perhaps one seeded player this year. Um, how much of a concern is that? Uh, I think I would respond by saying that these championships are um, have enduring appeal. They bring together the best tennis players in the world and 
there have been many years in the past where the st strength of the British field hasn't been that high, but the championships have nonetheless been very successful. So I would put it in a positive way, Mike, to say that we're not concerned about that, but obviously the, 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 the longer, the more British players there are and the longer they go in, uh, in, 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 in the tournament, that is obviously a, a big plus for the championships. Obviously, you, rat, you hand over a very uh, handsome surplus to the LTA every year. Do you have any sort of say in how they spend it, or are you able to let them know of your concerns if they're doing anything you don't like with the, the money that you've handed over? No. So the the way the arrangement works is that there are clear lines of delineation. So so the responsibility for the championships is fun fundamentally ours and the responsibility for tennis in Britain is that of the LTA so we don't uh, choose to involve ourselves in how they run um, their activities at all that's for them to decide and at the end of the day we are a you know we're a growing team but still a small team and we're very focused on what we do here to try and do the best job we can for the championships we are not necessarily experts in how to get more young kids playing tennis or those sorts of areas. Son? Uh, you mentioned the cooperation on tennis integrity. To play devil's advocate, I mean, it could be said that the IRP recommended that the streaming of live betting data should be stopped at 15k level and that the other bodies in the sport should help to recompense the ITF for any money lost in, in, on if that happened. Um, at the moment there, there doesn't seem to be any imminent sign of that happening, so is there, no, is there not a sort of reason to be concerned that, that there is lack of progress on that front? No, I don't think so. I think just in terms of the timing, the, the final report was published in December. Uh, I think tennis d did a good job of uh, bringing forward one of the key recommendations, probably the first recommendation that needed to be implemented, which was to sort out the new governance structure. And Jenny Price was appointed in January, so pretty, pretty soon after the final report was issued, she was appointed. And you'll know that the, the new governance structure requires an additional four further independent directors, as well as her, as well as four people from tennis. So it's a board of nine. And so one of Jenny's first tasks has been to find the other four board members. And she's made very good progress. She's pretty much at the end of that. And at Roland Garros, um, there will be the first board meeting of that new board of nine. Um, and that will be the time when the discussions about, OK, here are all the recommendations in the, in the IRP report. Which are the key ones? Which are the ones we need to focus on first? And and they will be um, actioned accordingly. So I would say progress has be, been reasonably good, to be honest. Can I just ask one more thing on Murray? Are, are you happy then that he would be, are you happy for him to basically to use a wild card to enter the tournament? Because conceivably as well, he could use his protected ranking, but you have no problem with him applying for wild cards. For them. Yeah, exactly, at this stage it's entirely up to Andy. It's in and his gift as to what he decides to do. OK, well, thank you all very much indeed for coming. Anybody who'd like to go on the tour, just a reminder, please congregate at this desk. And for everybody else, lunch is served upstairs. Thank you all very much.